Well, I guess I won't be needing this anymore, and you were the first person I thought of. Hey, buddy. Know what gets better. Just ask Temple fans from the fall season to the spring. Owl Sports Update is live, and it starts right now. Hello and welcome into a Valentine's Day edition of Owl Sports Update. He's Josh Safran and I'm Luke Milai, and we've got six different Temple teams to cover today. But first, we hit the hardwood. Yes, a men's update with three games over a 48-hour period, but we will get started with the women and the greatest score in program history. Mia Davis stands alone as the all-time leading scorer in Temple women's basketball history. She passed Marilyn Stevens' mark of 2,194 points, a record that remained untouched for 38 years. The similarities between the two doesn't stop with points scored, as both are top three in team history in made free throws, made field goals, and rebounds. You can't tell the story of Temple women's basketball without Stevens and Davis. I've enjoyed it, you know. And Mia is um, a wonderful young lady, so it couldn't happen to the best, you know, to a nicer person. Records are made to be broken, you know, and I'm quite sure she's setting records and then somebody's going to probably come 38 years and break her record. You just, it's, but it's nice. It's nice to have had it, um, but I really am excited that, you know, I've been a pioneer for someone else to carry the torch now that it's continuing. The watch list for the Cheryl Miller Award, which recognizes the best small forward in women's college basketball, was cut from 20 players to 10, and Mia Davis is still on the list. Davis has been a finalist three times. This award is voted on by the fans, and voting opens on Friday, February 11th. Among the finalists, Davis ranks fourth in points per game, averaging just over 19 per contest. And Davis was on the court Wednesday in a game versus USF. We pick things up in the second half where Davis took Bethy Manunga to the weight room. She finished with a team high 14 points. But at the other end, Manunga deposits two of her 13 on the night. Anaya Gordine's scoop layup cuts the lead to three in the fourth, but that's the last bucket the Owls score on the night. The Bulls hold the Owls to just four points in both the second and fourth quarters. Temple shot 29% from the field, 13% from three-point range, and went scoreless in the final 4-13 of game action. The Bulls take down the Owls 49-40. to you know, We fought really hard. Um, just unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I think the way that we play, um, and we only shot three free throws and um, just felt like we battled and didn't really, um, didn't really fall in our favor. And execute as best as I possibly can. Uh, filling in for Lex is filling in big shoes, but I go out there and I just work hard and that's more of my purpose. Let's go back in time. Sunday at home versus ECU. Temple looking to sweep the season series and you can count it and the foul for Mia Davis. She notched a team high 22 points in this game. Now Anaya Gordine getting involved from long range, and she sunk the only made three-point shot in the game for the Owls to extend their lead to nine. Through two and a half quarters, this game looks to be a dominant Temple victory as Shante Taylor gets in on the action. But don't count the Pirates out, at least as long as Tania Thompson has something to say about it. Thompson put up 23 points in just the second half. And this fourth quarter, Morgan Mosley jumper brings the game within one. But Imani Mayo, cool under pressure, secures the victory for the Owls, 60 to 59. It's almost Valentine's Day, which means it's time to give out our final roses to the basketball teams. On the women's side, my rose is going to Coranda Perea. Perea, the freshman transfer from George Washington, has been an absolute sniper for the Owls. Perea shoots a team high 39% from three-point range, and for a team that hits just set 24% of their threes, 
Perea's marksmanship has been massive. And on a night that will be overshadowed by Mia Davis's record-breaking performance, Perea posted a season-high 15 points, proving she's hitting her stride and the nylon at the right time. No Caleb Battle, no Jake Forrester, and maybe no Jeremiah Williams. So the final rose will go to one of the last men standing, the freshman from Camden, Zach Hicks. Hicks sent a Temple single seat, excuse me, single game record this season with his 10 threes against Delaware State. While Hicks has maintained his sharp shooting ability, he's now learning how to use his 6'7 frame in a Division I setting, averaging just over five and a half rebounds in his last six games. Another interesting note about Hicks, in games where he plays less than 24 minutes, Temple is 6-7. and seven. In games where he plays 24 minutes or more, Temple is 7-1. and one. The men travel to the Yingling Center in South Florida looking to take advantage of a team struggling in conference play. But early on, it was hard to tell which one of these teams were in the basement of conference standings. In the first half, Temple and USF combined to shoot just 34% from the field and just one made three off of 14 attempts from both sides. A bright spot for the Owls as Arashba Parks cleans up some leftovers from Ty Strickland. Now the second half, there is Ty Strickland finding Zach Hicks in the corner. Bang! That gives Temple their first lead of the second half. And now in the guts of the game, who's going to make that game-changing play? Ball batted around in rhythm. Javon Green chucks one up and hits it to put USF up one. A Hail Mary chance for the Owls, but they can't get the inbound. Owls lose a heartbreaker 52 to 49. Home court advantage is something that can't be measured on the stat sheet. The true excitement and intensity of thousands of screaming fans can only be felt by those right in the middle of it. Owl Sports Update's Hayden Bandell was at the Leacor Center to get an up-close look at what this crowd is all about in the Owl's win over Tulsa. Saturday afternoon at the Leacor Center and the Temple crowd trickled in just a few minutes before the game's opening tip. Low attendance numbers had plagued the squad early in the season, but when you've won six of eight, fans will take notice. The atmosphere has been great. Uh, I love our fans. It's starting to grow as we win, so we just got to keep going. The Owls have been feeding off the crowd. Temple is 8-3 and three at home, and that includes four wins in their last five at the Leah Chorus Center. As for Saturday, 5,045 fans were on hand, the highest number in conference all season, and the Owls repaid their fan faithful by putting on a show versus Tulsa. Nick Jordan posted his first career double-double, and Zach Kicks made this shot with 329 left that put the Owls ahead for good. How about that? That's probably his first layup this year. I said, you got to start getting to the basket. Coming down the stretch, the Owls went 8-for-8 eight eight from the free throw line to shut down any thoughts of a Tulsa comeback. These are the situations that we practice with these guys. With free throw shooting late in games. Again, we don't, we don't do it right all the time, but we do it at the right time. The Owls have seven games left in the regular season, but just three are at home, leaving fans with just a few more chances to catch a team playing its best ball of the season. At the Leah Core Center, I'm Hayden Bandell, Owls Sports Update. I have a feeling that's not the last time we'll see Mr. Bandell on today's show. Now, Courts and Sessions' Ray Dunn took a trip down to Kinston, North Carolina, Damian Dunn's hometown, before the Owls took on ECU last week. Friday on Courts and Session, Ray takes us through Dunn's deep connection with his hometown, which has long been a breeding ground for NBA talent. So these kids know that, hey, Brandon Ingram, Jerry Stackhouse, these guys went to uh, Rochelle Middle School. These guys went to Kenson High School. If they can make it, I can make it. So it gives them a blueprint to follow, and it gives them all hope. Again, look for Ray's piece Friday at noon with Courts in Session. You can watch the show on our YouTube channel, our website, owlsportsupdate.com, or just follow us on social. It's time for our first break, but coming up, we've got love on the tennis courts. Like, sets that ended in six love again and again and again. <laughs> well, Luke's heart wasn't the only thing broken last week. A broken track and field record and the start of a new lacrosse season for one nationally ranked team. Plus... I'm Hayden Vandell at the Smith Memorial Playground. After the break, I'll tell you about the Temple flavor found in found here 
at the Fairmount Park. That's coming your way in 90 seconds. We're back, and aside from all the current Temple athletes, we want to take a look at Temple's relationship with our surrounding community and how some former legends are being honored. Now Sports Update's Hayden Bandell is on the scene. Hayden, this park is honoring two of Temple's best. Thanks, guys. I'm here at the Smith Memorial Playground at Fairmount Park, where the city is honoring their second annual Leaders and Legends of Philadelphia exhibit. And this one has some Temple flavor. The exhibit honors 12 African-American leaders and legends in several fields, and it is, of course, open to the public. One panelist includes former Temple basketball and Hall of Fame head coach John Chaney, former Temple women's lacrosse coach Tina Sloan Green, who was the first black coach in women's intercollegiate lacrosse, is also on display. On Saturday, Allison Williams Bruno spoke to honor the late Sloan, to late, the late Sloan Green, who inspired her to play lacrosse before they even met. On Saturday, Mayor Jim Kenny and Francis Hoover, the executive director of the program, also was on this, was was here, showing off its second showing off their second annual Leaders and Legends of Philadelphia. I'm from Fairmount Park. I'm Hayden Vandell. Josh and Luke, back to you at the desk. Thanks, Hayden. Bonnie Rosen is heading into her 16th season at the helm of Temple Lacrosse, but this year's squad might be facing the highest expectations of her entire tenure. Owl Sports Update's Vic Ragapathy has more. Temple Lacrosse enters the season ranked 22nd in the nation. Not bad for a team that went 6-11 just three years ago. In the eyes of players like Nina Hine, the honor is well-deserved. It's been a long time coming, you know. They were sleeping on us for so long. It's about time they recognize the talent that is in this program. The ranking comes after the Owls' most successful season in over two decades. Led by nine seniors, Temple made it to the second round of the 2021 NCAA tournament. There was a lot of experience and leadership um, that was in that class. Um, and so our seniors are, are figuring it out one step at a time. Bell Master Pietro is the AAC preseason midfielder of the year. She has her sights set on duplicating last season's success. You know, we have lost some people, but we all, we've gained like so much, so much talent as well. And uh, we're just looking forward to building on what we did last year and just continuing to succeed. That talent comes in the form of five freshmen and three transfers, not to mention the newest addition to the Owls coaching staff, former Villanova attack Liz Trojan. She has no problem speaking up and telling us what we need to do. And uh, she's, she's just been a great addition to this team. The journey back to the NCAAs begins February 12th at home against Army. From Howarth Field, Vic Ragupathi, Owl Sports Update. The Owls kick things off with a two-game homestand. First, battling with the Army at Howarth Field on February 12th. They follow it up with a matchup against the Villanova Wildcats next Wednesday at 6 o'clock. These games mark two of a three-game stretch that has the Owls staying in the Keystone State until February 26th. If you follow us on Twitter at OwlSportsUpdate or go to our website, OwlSportsUpdate.com, you can check out Matt Aquino's article previewing the Owls season. From the cold to the cozy heck tennis center where the men took on the St. Francis Terriers. Temple in black shorts, St. Francis in the blue. And after forcing a tie break, St. Francis narrowly wins the double set seven games to six. But once the Owls got into singles play, it was utter domination. Moran Delmas with a backhand placement. He swept his matchup. Now, Leo Rakin wins a nail-biting first set seven games to five and sweeps his match too. Finally, Louis Gorgas popping it over his opponent. Temple dominates St. Francis 6-2-1. Life as a student athlete is already busy enough on its own. The lifting, training, and practice can take its toll. But imagine adding ROTC training to that load. Well, that's life through the eyes of junior Sophia Galati. Owl Sports Update's Jake Gable has more. Track as a sprinter and jumper. ROTC and nursing school, all are hard on their own. But try all three at once. 
That's just a day in the life for junior Sophia Galetti. Every day starts before the sun is even up. It's just so routine at this point that I don't even know anything else other than just what I do now. While ROTC teaches leadership, track develops teamwork, both of which Sophia embodies and needs to excel. There's so many parallels between you know being a cadet and then being a student athlete. With a schedule this busy, you can find her all over campus, from studying for her nursing major to here at the ROTC Training Center, and finally here at the Star Training Complex. Not only that, but also a morning lift, clinicals, and a late night workout at the pool. Sophie is our, our bumblebee, um, full of energy, full of life. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how she does it. While juggling all of this, she still manages to bring a smile to everyone's face with her beaming enthusiasm. I'm amazed myself at what she does and how she does it, but knowing her personality over the last couple of years that she's been here, nothing really surprises me of what Sophie's capable of doing. I don't really regret anything at all. If anything, I wish I was involved in more things and I wish I am able to meet more people. Reporting for Owl Sports Update, I'm Jake Gable. Breaking a school record is not something that can be overlooked. Junior Tanaki Strawn rewrote the Temple history books for the triple jump this past weekend. Jumping the distance of 12.93 meters, she shattered her previous record of 12.4, with an increase of about two feet for those uninterested in the metric system. There's one meet left before AAC championships, so there's still time to buy stock in Strawn as she looks to build on her already impressive resume. In just the last two seasons, Temple football has started six different quarterbacks. New head coach Stan Drayton is bringing in fresh blood at the QB position with a Hall of Fame pedigree. We'll hear from Elijah Warner for the first time. One future Owl with NFL aspirations, along with a couple that have already made it to the big stage. Owl Sports Update will be right back. There's still about 200 days until we have Owls football on the link, but that doesn't mean Temple's new head coach, Stan Drayton, has been active in the recruiting circuit. We bring on Owl Sports Update's Matt Rainier at the studio set with the latest behind center. Hey, Matt. Thanks, guys. The quarterback is the most important position in football, and many quarterbacks entering college often draw from the lessons they've learned from their local coaches. However, it's not every day that those lessons are taught by a Hall of Fame quarterback, but that is exactly the case for recent Temple commit Elijah Warner. For anyone who followed the 2021 Temple football team, one thing was apparent. The offense was a major problem. However, this may be about to change for the Owls with the arrival of quarterback Elijah Warner. Elijah brings a unique point of view to the team's quarterback room, as he is the son of Hall of Fame quarterback and Super Bowl champion Kurt Warner. When I went there and visited, I just fell in love with the place. The relationships with the coaches and the coaching staff was awesome. As if being the son of an NFL quarterback isn't easy enough, Elijah lives under the same roof as an NFL Hall of Famer. He has always viewed this relationship as a chance to improve his abilities at quarterback. Kurt played a huge role in Elijah's development, which ended up landing him a Division I scholarship. His knowledge and training with him has definitely shaped me into the quarterback I am today and definitely grateful that I've, I've had that in my life and I think it's taking me this far and hopefully it will take me farther. Having a Hall of Fame quarterback as a father will certainly help Elijah adjust to the speed of college football, but he may have a bit of extra motivation to help turn the program around. As head coach Stan Drayton explained that Elijah had actually been snubbed by a number of different colleges during his recruitment process. He's got this little chip on the shoulder, uh, had a negative uh, recruiting experience early on. He has a chip on his shoulder and hey man, that's, <laughs> that's a temple fit to me. Of course, Warner isn't the only quarterback on the roster, but he does hope to one day be the focus of a Temple offense under the team's rookie head coach. Despite missing his junior year with an injury, Elijah still finished his high school career with over 3,400 passing yards, throwing 31 touchdowns. Some of his standout performances included his senior year opener in which he threw five touchdown passes. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Matt Rainier. Luke and Josh, back to you. Thank you, Matt. Now, Warner is an owl with dreams of one day reaching the pros, and some former owls have provided a blueprint on just how to get there. Of course, so is his dad, but we digress. 
Josh in here to highlight a couple of those big time names who used to play at 10th and Diamond. Some big names and some big guys, none bigger than the Bills tackle Deion Dawkins. Dawkins miraculously found the end zone in each of his first two seasons with the Bills, but this year he really cemented himself as one of the league's top pass blockers. Dawkins was the 17th ranked tackle of the season according to Pro Football Focus, and Dawkins played 1,089 offensive snaps, good for 12th best in the league. And in those snaps, he only allowed four sacks. Another big guy this time on the other side of the ball is Hassan Reddick. The 13th overall pick in the 2017 draft to the Cardinals, and he's moved on from Arizona to Temple South with Matt Rule and the Carolina Panthers, who had seven Temple alum on the roster last season. Now, Reddick was a dominant force at Temple, and he's only gotten better in the pros. After having a career best nine and a half sacks his senior season, Reddick is coming off of his second straight 10 plus sack season in the NFL. It's break time. Up next, we take a look at the men and women in charge of getting these athletes ready for the professional world and the unique experience they all share. Owl Sports Update returns in 90 seconds. Welcome back to Owl Sports Update. The next time you head over to the Leah Kors Center, take a good look around. You might realize that some of the team's biggest fans are coming to support more than just the athletes. I talked with some of the Temple coaches with a front row seat to just about every game. The home court advantage is real in college sports. But it's not always about how many are in the stands. Sometimes it's about who is in the stands. This picture of golf coach Brian Quinn celebrating Damian Dunn's game winner against ECU went viral. And Quinn in his Black Temple top is actually like this just about every game. In fact, it's common to see Temple coaches in the stands watching their peers throughout the year. It's, it's camaraderie. This camaraderie brings a mutual understanding of just how hard it is to be a head coach at the Division I level. You know, coaching is a really challenging profession at times, and having relationships with people who know what it's like is part of what kind of fills the tank. These relationships are often built from time spent in staff meetings and can be strong enough to bring an entire athletic department together. All Temple head coaches get complimentary seats at the men's basketball game. But for golf head coach Brian Quinn, a respect for the last three men's basketball coaches has pushed him to upgrade to these courtside seats. Uh, I've had those courtside seats for a long, long time now. We're just so blessed at Temple to have such three amazing uh, mentors and coaches. For Aaron McKee, this respect goes both ways. And I can remember going out to the NCAAs with Quinny one year when Brandon Matthews was playing. Watching him compete, that just blew Brandon away. Um, I expect that from Aaron. Um, he's just uh, his first class of guy. Brian Quinn and his son Christian haven't missed a home game in years, and they told me they don't plan on missing any games in the final stretch of the season. Another full weekend coming up for Temple Athletics. We'll see the women's tennis team taking on Villanova this Saturday. Track and field has a, lo a weekend long meet at the David Henry Valentine Invite. Gymnastics goes on the road to Chapel Hill to take on North Carolina. Men's basketball travels to Tulane for a huge conference matchup. And finally, the women travel to Oklahoma to take on Tulsa, where there is only one hurricane. To catch all of our shows and additional content, be sure to follow us on social media at Owl Sports Update. Well, enjoy watching the big game, everyone. Have a happy Valentine's Day, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. For Luke Meli, I'm Josh Safran. Have a great weekend, everybody.